Okay, well, it's great to be here. Um, this is the second in the series of talks that I've been giving here. And today is about the deep structure of cosmology and the anthropic question. And I must warn you that um, this is the most adventurous of the talks I'll be giving here. Um, I thought it would be fun to push things a bit. I want you to be, uh, I may take you places you don't particularly want to go, but be a little bit patient and then you can argue with me <laughs> as we go. So the, the first question is what's the scope of cosmology? And I want to distinguish what I will call cosmology and cosmologia. I used to talk about cosmology with a capital C and a small c, but this was got difficult and so I want to distinguish what I call cosmology and cosmologia. So I define cosmology as dealing with physical cosmology and the related mathematical and physical issues. Define and testing of mathematical physics theories for the physical universe on large scales and so on. So this is what happens in physics and astronomy departments so, uh, and applied mathematics departments. So cosmology is that stuff, stuff and um, there's a huge number of books there on cosmology in that sense. And this is the standard picture which um, you, you all will know if you've studied any cosmology at all, the start of the universe, quantum fluctuations of some kind, inflation, last scattering, the dark ages, formation of structure, formation of life, and we're here at the present day. And I talked about that at length the other night, I'm going to talk, not talk about that anymore, but this is the subject of cosmology. The scope of cosmologia is also deals with physical cosmology, that's part of it, but in addition deals in one way or another with the major themes of existence, meaning, purpose, etc. that are raised by the nature of the physical universe as the context for our existence in a way compatible with what we know about cosmology and physics. And so the universe is the context for our existence. Okay, it allows us to exist. but. If you want to go on from that and talk in some serious sense about meaning, purpose, uh, the meaning of life and all of that sort of stuff, you, you will take seriously cosmology as I've defined it, but this raises a whole lot of further issues. So, and this necessarily relates to many major themes in philosophy. This is thousand year old themes in philosophy. It has to propose how one might take some kind of stand on these issues of meaning and purpose and so on if it's to do its job properly in this highly controversial territory. And I got this from um, my friend John Ellis. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? One of Paul Gauguin's most famous paintings. And this inscription in the original French is up there in the top left hand corner. Um, and the, the point about this is the philosophy of cosmology can deal with either Co philosophy of cosmology can deal with cosmology, we're just going to deal with the physical universe, or it can deal with cosmologia, the physical universe and whatever that might have to mean, say, about the meaning of life and the meaning of our existence and all the rest of that. Considering, in, But in either case, the nature of argument and data use must be correct for that enterprise. In particular, either case, the claims made and the possibility of testing them must be, a, must be appropriate. You must use the appropriate method of argumentation and the appropriate data. So philosophy of cosmology discussions need to make clear which topic they are dealing with. Either is a legitimate topic for investigation and one can choose which to tackle. What is not okay is to use only the methods of the first and to claim to solve problems of the second. If one wants to tackle cosmologia in the sense I've defined it, you must use adequate methods to do so involving adequate scope of inquiry and data. And we have seen a whole rash of books and popular talks and so on coming out in which people use the methods of cosmology but make major claims about cosmologia. And I think that is a completely inappropriate thing to do. I think it is a, a misuse. Of, and I'm, I'm going to take you into the territory where cosmologia lives and and then you can say I'm not interested, you say I don't want to do that, or you can say I do want to do that, but I'm going to indicate what I think is the way one should go if one is dealing with cosmology rather than just cosmology. So the take home message is cosmological theory may be taken either to deal just with physics issues, cosmology, how things work, a study of physics, or also with issues to do with meaning and why things are the way they are. 
cosmologia that also involves philosophical questions. Once be clear which is the project at hand and make that clear to yourself. And either is a legitimate area of study, but one must use data and methods of argumentation appropriate to which topic has been chosen. Now, the famous question, the anthropic question, the universe is biofriendly because life exists. That's simply a fact. Now, many, many studies ranging back for a very long time have established what is a scientific conclusion, significant alteration of either physical laws or boundary conditions at the beginning of the universe would prevent the existence of intelligent life as we know it in the universe. If the physical laws were altered by a remarkably little amount, no evolutionary process at all of living beings would be possible. So the laws of physics appear fine-tuned to allow the existence of life. And the anthropic question is why is this so? So what I'm saying here is that is a statement of fact. Um, in a world of counterfactual physics, you take the laws of physics, you alter them a little bit, and you ask yourself, would it still be possible for life to exist? And that's a question of physics and its relation to biology. And uh, So it's not a question of philosophy. The anthropic question, the philosophic question is, why is it true that physics is fine-tuned in order to allow life to exist. Now, a very nice discussion of this is a book by Martin Rees, The Astronomer Royals, Just Six Numbers. You have to have the electrical force to gravitational force. Its value is 10 to the 36. It has to be very close to that in order that things work, will work out properly. The strength of nuclear binding must be about that value. The normalized amount of matter in the universe must be about what we see. The normalized cosmological constant must be about what we see. And the inhomogeneous for cosmic structures must be um, one in 100,000. And the number of spatial dimensions must be three. Other people have got other uh, sets of such results. In fact, there are many other ones, but this, this is uh, Martin Rees's one. He says, if these um, different constants of nature don't have those values, life would not be possible. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that. His book is a popular book, very, very good reading. Now, Max Tegmark is a person who has written about this quite a lot, and what he plots is the electromagnetic coupling constant, that's the strength of the electric force, against the strong energy coupling, uh, strong coupling uh, constant, which is what holds nuclei and atom together. <coughs> and in the yellow region, carbon is unstable, which means no life. In the purple region, everything becomes diprotons, and there's no atoms. In the blue region, there are no non-relativistic atoms. So you have to be in that little white area in order that life would exist. So if you scatter universes around with different values of these constants, a very small fraction of those universes will allow atoms to exist, such as carbon, out of which we are made. And, and so that, this is a purely physical argument which leads to this result. So, that, so there's no philosophy in that, that's physics. Here's another one, also again from Max Tegmart. How many spatial dimensions and time dimensions do we need in order that life can exist? If, um, <coughs> if there are no uh, time dimensions, then your equations are elliptic and uh, things are unpredictable. If, if you have um, too few dimensions, life is too simple. If you have too many dimensions, life is unstable or it's unpredictable. In that one there, you only get tachyons. Up there, it's unstable. You have to have one time dimension and three space dimensions in order that we can exist. Now, this is very important because nowadays physicists are thinking of all sorts of possible dimensionalities. Incidentally, uh, just for instance, with two dimensions, you can't make a living uh, system in two dimensions because you can't get the third dimension to wire things together in the proper kind of, kind of way. So these are the kind of physics arguments which restrict under what circumstances life would be possible. Now, so physicists then have gone on and to say, why does the universe have these peculiar properties that allow intelligent life to exist? And that's the anthropic issue. And it's claimed, and there's a lot of prominent people who support this, like Martin Rees, Steven Weinberg, Max Tegmark, and many others, this is because of the physical existence of ensembles of universes or multiverses where the laws of physics are different in different universes. So there isn't only one universe, there's a whole slew, hundreds of billions of people even talk about millions of universes, and in each of them the constants of physics are different. 
If you have enough such universes out there, then by chance, in some of them, things will work out all right. And we, of course, will live in such a universe because we are here. And so we will see these constants to have the value they have as a selection effect. The selection effect, because we exist, and we exist as observers because the constants are right for us. And so the explanation for the fine-tuning in that case is there's this zillions of universes out there with random variation of these constants for some reason or other, which is a whole other question one can go into. And this is then being increasingly defended because it's the only purely scientific approach to solving the puzzles raised by the anthropic issue. In, if enough variety of properties occur, then somewhere conditions will be right. At least that's the example. For example, this argument has been used to explain in particular the value of the cosmological constant. And, and at the present time, the universe is accelerating its expansion. It is not slowing down, it is speeding up. Now, Steven Weinberg, who is a very, very powerful physicist, worked out a long while ago, if the cosmological constant was too big, then structure as we see it in the universe, galaxies, clusters of galaxies wouldn't have formed because the cosmological constant would have blown them apart before gravitational attraction could pull them together. If it's too much negative, then the universe would collapse uh, before structures could form and so you have to fine-tune the value of the cosmological constant in order that life could exist and this is one of the famous examples. And this pr potentially brings cosmology within the realm of statistical analysis because it gives you a base for probability. And it provides, in fact, what I think people regard as the only scientific basis for attempts to use the anthropic principle to determine the value of parameters such as the cosmological constant for which we otherwise have no plausible explanation. But is it science or philosophy if it is unverifiable? And that's what I will talk about in lecture four because the problem with the multiverse is we haven't seen any of those other universes. They often claim there's an infinite number. We've seen one. <laughs> And we have no causal connect connection with any of those other ones. So you are postulating vast numbers of other sub, uh, universes out there with no m method whatever, or almost no method of proving they exist. So this may or may not be science. Uh, it may be metaphysics rather than physics. Uh, it, its underlying thing is it's denying the uniqueness of the universe. Now from my viewpoint as an old hand at cosmology, the key point about the universe, there's one universe and it's a unique universe. And this is a way of denying that basic view of the nature of the universe. So I'm not going to say any more about this at the moment. I'll, I'll be talking about this in lecture four. The issue there is, is this genuinely a scientific explanation or is it philosophy dressed up as science? And I know some people here are very interested in that question. So the take home message too, we do know that existence of life depends on many aspects of the laws of physics and the nature of the universe that are very special. We can easily imagine universes where no life whatever would occur. Physics and cosmology are fine-tuned so the universe is bio-friendly. A popular explanation is that th this is because a multiverse exists. However, this may not be an observationally testable idea. And so it may be science or it may be philosophy. Okay, now what I want to do, and in fact this is my kind of new contribution in this talk, is talk, talk about the foundations of uh, the best foundation for studying all of this is to talk about physical possibility spaces. And the idea is that underlying physical existence of various possibility spaces constraining what is possible. A physics possibility space, omega physics, biology possibility spaces, omega biology. And these are the framework of what is possible. Nothing physical can exist outside what these permit. Th these are basically a way of talking about the laws of physics, but the laws of physics are philosophically very difficult because you don't know if they are descriptive or prescriptive and there's no easy way to deal with that. It's easier to talk about the solutions of the laws which are in a sense another way of talking about the laws. These possibility frame are the framework of what is pos possible. Nothing physical can exist about outside what they exist. And the idea is that under the transient physical world that actually happens is an eternal, unchanging world of possibilities. And of course, that sounds <laughs> very much like... Um, it, it sounds like a very, very old philosophical idea. Now, the issue 
is the relation of physical laws to possibility spaces, are physical laws prescriptive, do they describe, do they, do they control what is happening, or are they descriptive, do they just happen to describe what is happening, which are very, very different kind of things. It's highly disputed territory. And I'm suggesting that possibility spaces are the best way to describe this because they give all possible outcomes of the equation. Now, in classical physics, these are phase spaces, which are spaces of positions and velocity or momentum. And many, many discussions of classical physics talk about phase spaces, which are the, the possibility spaces of classical physics. And quantum physics, they are Hilbert spaces. These are abstract vector spaces of dimension n, possessing an inner product that is complete, and n can and often is infinite. So this is the uh, phase space of a simple pendulum. Uh, you've got the angle and, um, and, and the potential energy there. And, and this is the phase space there. The, um, the angle and the velocity looks like this. And these, this is the pendulum which has been pushed so much that it goes over the top. It goes round and round. These are pendulums which are oscillating. And that diagram in one diagram, it gives you all possible motions of the, the pendulum, the potential in your face portrait of a simple pendulum. The x-axis being angular wraps around itself after 2 pi, and so it, it joins up around itself in, two, in 2 pi. So this and this are actually the same, and it, it's been unwrapped to enable you to see it. So this is a pictorial view of all possible motions of the pendulum. This is the possibility space for that pendulum. In cosmology, there's wonderful work being done in cosmology. I've actually edited a book on phase spaces in cosmology. This is from a book by Jürgen Ehlers and Wolfgang Rindler, All Possible Robertson Walker Universe Models of Matter, Radiation, and a Cosmological Constant. And it's a three-dimensional diagram. And these are sub-diagrams in which there's no radiation, there's no matter, there's no cosmological constant, and there is no curve. And what this does, it shows all possible behaviors of the standard models of cosmology if they have got matter, radiation, and a cosmological constant. So they're a very, very convenient way of describing what is possible in cosmology. The real universe would be one curve in the space of possible of possibilities. Okay? <clears throat> This is a representation of a Hilbert space. It's a representation of a basis of a high dimensional Hilbert space. And well, one has the problem here that the dimensions of the Hilbert space are much bigger than <laughs> the dimensions of the screen. It's trying to show a basis, the Hilbert space, with a very large number of dimensions. It's a kind of graphical representation of that. Now, what is crucial in this is to distinguish ep ep epistemology and ontology. So, the physical possibility spaces are eternal and unchanging. Um, Newton's laws of motion sets you a certain set of possible motions for any object, whatever. Those possibilities do not change. They have to conserve momentum, angular momentum, and so on. Now, what we know about them is changes with time. So we project the possibility space into our knowledge space of physics, which changes with time and culture. And this must use some specific representation which is culturally constructed. So the physics space has been there since the start of the universe. It, is, it has said that you can't violate energy conservation, you can't violate momentum conservation, and that has always been true and always will be true. So it is a platonic kind of fact. What we know about it is our vision of this, and we didn't know this until a couple of hundred years ago, we now do know it, and so what happens on the left is a changing thing of time, what happens on the right does not change, and one must be very, very clear about this, that the eternal unchanging space is, is exactly that. It's a platonic kind of space. What we know about it does change with time. And a lot of the problems with possibility spaces is people don't make clear this distinction. And then only a subspace of this space allows life to exist. Um, and only a subspace of this is realized in the real physical world. So in the real physical world, some parts of these possibility will be realized and most of them will not be realized. And that's the way that the thing works out. Physics possibility spaces, this is the possibility space for nuclei. It's a nuclear landscape, neutron number versus proton number. You can only get nuclei which lie within 
that um, island of stability. That's the landscape of nuclear physics as a possibility space for nuclei and hence for atoms. This is the standard model of particle physics, this set of the three generations of matter, gauge bosons, Higgs boson. Underlying this is a symmetry group, uh, not SU5. Um, so underlying this is a space of symmetries and the space of possible symmetries includes SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 which leads to this structure. It also includes SU5 which many people thought for a very long time was the grand unified group. It turned out it wasn't but in terms of possibilities, theoretical possibilities, this is just as possible as this one is. So physical possibilities, the values of the fundamental constants could in principle be different. The fine structure constant, the proton to electron mass ratio, the proton neutron mass difference, the coupling constant for the strong force. One of the difficult issues in this, how do we know which are fundamental that cannot be derived from the others? And do we know that they might vary? And there's a very nice article on this by Jean-Philippe Uzan. If they can be derived from another theory, then they are not fundamental. That other theory becomes a fundamental theory. And so, for instance, at the present time, many people believe a landscape of string theory is a possibility space for physics and for fundamental constants. So, if you're a string theorist, that is a possibility space. The landscape of string theory is precisely the kind of thing that I'm talking about. In biology, there are many, many possibility spaces. There's a classical vast literature on the lotka volterra equation and the interaction of two species leading to face planes just like the cosmology ones and this is from mathematical ecology course university college london this is the possibilities for the interactions of two species uh, interacting in a particular way um, evolution has got the fitness landscapes. The Waddington talked about fitness landscapes. They represent populations of biological entities as clusters of points with each point representing a unique genotype. The axes correspond to the loci of these genotypes and the resulting mean population fitness is, is the height. Uh, and these depend on local ecological conditions and you've got a possibility space and any particular population will make its way through uh, adaptive processes through this possibility landscape. On the micro scale, examples, the fitness landscape of a tRNA gene, the local fitness landscape of the green fluorescent protein. Histone mutations prom promote sarcomagenesis through altered histone methylation landscape. You will find if you look at the, the literature on microbiology, people are talking about possibility spaces uh, in, in very, very interesting ways. And the book which does this in a particularly beautiful way, this book, Arrival of the Fittest by Andres Wagner, Sol Solving Evolution's Greatest Puzzle, has got a fantastic description of the possibility spaces underlying microbiology. And there's a possibility space for, for, the, for the genome to, uh, to, to phenotype map for proteins, for metabolic networks, for gene regulatory networks, and for signal transduction networks. And what these possibility spaces do, they they lay out all possible proteins, all possible metabolic networks, all possible gene regulatory networks, and all possible signal transduction networks. The ones which actually get realized are a small subset of that space. Proteins are in fact the magic of biology. The underlying physics allows them to have their conformational shapes. And it is the shapes of these protein molecules which underlies biological activity. Now they can have these shapes because the physics allows those shapes to occur. So the physical biological space underlies the biological possibility space. And Wagner has got a description of the space of all possible proteins. And it's incredibly complicated. Physics is absolutely trivially easy compared with this kind of microbiology. Metabolic networks. There's possibility spaces for metabolic networks where you map genotypes to phenotypes. And Wagner's book discusses this in detail. I'm not going to try to go through that. But it's a map from the genotypes to the phenotypes via the metabolic networks. This is an integrated genetic, genomic and systems approach to find gene networks regulated by the interaction of light and carbon signaling pathways in Arideopsis. And this is a possible interaction of all of these differences, the genetic, genomic systems approach. Uh, and this is one of the possibilities which Wagner's approach allows to happen. 
and this one of course does happen there are hundreds of thousands of millions which are possible and which do not happen so evolution at the macro scale is only possible on the basis of evolution at the micro scale exploring these biological possibility spaces within the available time since the start of the universe this is only possible because of massive degeneracy in the genotype to phenotype map huge numbers of genotypes lead to the same phenotypes and this is just a little side thing one of the really difficult things for physicists in looking at biology is how is there time to explore the possibilities of protein since the beginning of the universe giving the incredible number of proteins and it's a very trivial calculation which Fred Hoyle did for, for RNA and DNA where the same issue arises at a first glance it's completely impossible for biology to explore all the possibilities since the beginning of the universe because the number of possibilities to be explored is so huge and Andreas Wagner's book gives an answer to how that is possible so I strongly recommend this book for anybody who's interested in that topic a key issue is what's the relation between these spaces, particularly what aspects of physics possibility spaces, my spaces makes life possible. That's the anthropic issue, and I've given you some examples of that. What aspects of physics and biology spaces make intelligence possible, and we don't know the answer to that. And this is all the subject of emergence, and that emergence is made possible by a combination of bottom-up and top-down causation, which I'll talk about in those further talks. Only some subspace um, of the physics space allows life to exist, and that's the anthropic issue. Why is the universe that has come into existence a realization of some spot of omega physics which allows life when it could have principle have been a realization of some part which does not allow life to exist? So the take-home message. The deep underlying structure of cosmology is possibility spaces which exist in the cases of physics and biology. One must carefully distinguish epistemology and ontology when discussing them. These possibility spaces are timeless and unchanging abstract spaces. They are platonic spaces. What actually happens can only occur within the limits they define and that is why they are the deep underlying feature of cosmology. So these spaces, these possibilities existed at the start of the universe, life only came into being later on, but the possibility of life was there at the very start of the universe. One of the most difficult questions is, did that in some sense exist before the universe came into existence? And I won't even begin to try to answer that. I will just say the following, that an instant after the start of the universe, these possibility spaces for physics and biology were there, and gradually the structures that developed in the universe explored some part of these spaces and didn't explore others. So in, for instance in the landscape of possible animals, some animals that are possible have been realized, a great many which could have come into existence have not been realized, at least haven't been realized on earth. And so this is the way that the thing goes. But you cannot realize an animal which isn't a possible animal. You cannot realize a physical outcome which isn't a physical outcome. And these spaces describe those possibilities. Now, this is where it gets more interesting. There's another set of possibility spaces which are logical possibility spaces. As well as physical and biological possibilities, there are, in my opinion, logical possibility spaces. One for mathematics, one for computer algorithms, one for logic, one for language. These are comprehended by the human mind and therefore causally effective in the real world. Now the easiest one to deal with is mathematics. And my claim, and now there's a large dispute about this, but working mathematicians, what working mathematicians experience is not that they are making up mathematics, they're experiencing that they are exploring the nature that mathematics is. There's a huge difference between those two things. So mathematics, in my opinion, is a case of a platonic world of mathematical abstractions being learnt about by the human mind, then being causally effective in terms of creating patterns on paper and through the underlying physics, engineering, commerce and planning in general. And so a major part of mathematics are discovered rather than invented. For example, the classic example is irrational numbers. The ancient Greeks were trying to find a rational expression for the square root of 2. And to their great dismay, they discovered that the square root of 2 could not be expressed in a rational way. 
Now, that's the hallmark of a discovery of the nature of something. It's, it's the hallmark of something which you're not making up. They discovered that, and we are convinced that any mathematician anywhere in the universe will also discover that the square root of 2 is irrational. And so that is the kind of thing which is true timelessly and eternally. It's a platonic fact. It's an abstract fact. It's, you, you can't determine that by experiment. You determine it by logical argumentation. So the claim is that facts like this are independent of the existence and culture of human beings and presumably it's independent of the universe itself. If mathematics underlies physics, as many people believe, then these mathematical kinds of facts in some sense control what happens in physics. Now that's one of the big questions we don't really understand. Roger Penrose talks about this in The Large, The Small and The Human Mind. And Jean-Pierre Chanjo and Alain Kahn talk about it in conversations on mind, matter, and mathematics. So, two basic features. Pythagoras' theorem is true on Earth. It's true anywhere else in the universe. The area and radius of a circle are given in terms of the number pi, which is a universal constant. And that constant will be the same everywhere in the universe. So it has the nature of a platonic fact. The same result will be discovered near Alpha Centauri or the Andromeda Galaxy or anywhere else, which is why attempts to think about how we would relate to extraterrestrial intelligence have used relationships like these as the beginning of a start of conversation which those extraterrestrial intelligences. The Mandelbrot set was sitting there waiting to be discovered for four 14 billion years could only be discovered when human beings created computers of sufficient power to make that. But the structure didn't come into existence then. The structure was in a platonic sense sitting there since the beginning of the universe. We only discovered it in recent times when we had computers of sufficient power. How can we comprehend platonic spaces? One of the major philosophical arguments against platonic spaces have been that the human mind cannot comprehend them and so they have no interaction with the physical world. And there's a wonderful book by Paul Churchland called Plato's Camera which answers that objection in detail. And I think it's a very important book. In Plato's Camera, according to the blurb, eminent philosopher Paul Churchland offers a novel account of how the brain constructs a representation or takes a picture of the universal universe's timeless categorical and dynamical structure. Neural nets can recognize these universal patterns. He discusses in depth how this happens. And the subtitle, Plato's Camera, how the physical brain captures a landscape of abstract universals. And so the mind is able to comprehend them by comprehending these patterns and arguing logically about them. Why? Because the mind is an emergent structure which can undertake logical argumentations which are valid argumentations. And so the claim that they cannot have an effect on the real world is untrue. The number pi has an effect on the real world through engineers using it to design things, uh, machines, locomotives and so on, where they use the number phi to do their calculations. So the number pi goes through the engineer's mind into designs, into things which actually work on the surface of the earth. Another example of <coughs> is the space of algorithms. Now the example I like to use is sorting. This is quick sort in a little um, pseudo code and the thing about this is that if you're a computer scientist and you're teaching a first year course you discover there are maybe there's a computer scientist there I don't know 25 different ways of sorting quick sort heap sort bubble sort and you name it what I'm claiming is that any computer scientist anywhere else in the universe would discover the same set of sorting algorithms because these are the only possible set of sorting algorithms. And the possibility of these algorithms also is a timeless, unchanging fact about the nature of the universe. At least that would be my claim. And again, it's very important here to distinguish. These facts are there. What we know about them is over there. There's a projection from there to there. The logical possibilities are eternal and unchanging. And most of the confusion about this is people say mathematics is something which is changing with time. What we understand about mathematics changes with time. It depends on our culture and the time and the represent 
adaptation chain. It's socially constructed. This is not socially constructed. Now, most of the confusion is because people don't make the distinction between the ontological thing and our epistemological representation of it. There's also a possibility space for language. There's a finite set of sentences that is possible, a finite set of thoughts. It's not possible to think a sentence unless it is possible to think it. Now that might sound to scientologists, it's actually a very, very deep statement. You can only think things if it's possible to think them. This possibility of thinking specific thoughts is, in my opinion, built into the foundations of the universe in exactly the same way as the mathematical possibilities, the algorithmic possibilities, because this is an example of another logical um, <coughs> statement. And so in my opinion, the possibility of thinking about meaning and existence, right and wrong, good and bad, democracy, and all the rest of it, those possibilities of those thoughts were there in exactly the same as the other ones at the start of the universe. They were only realized when people came into existence, or intelligent beings. But nevertheless, you can make a library of all possible thoughts. And in fact, the Library of Babel, the book by George Louis Borges, uh, was a library of all possible books. And this Andreas Wagner in this book discusses that and how you can make a library of all possible books. Now that library of all possible books will have many, many books which are meaningless, but it will include every possible book which could be written in a, fi in a finite time. And so the library of possible thoughts can be put down, it is a timeless, unchanging reality which can be represented in many, many different ways. So the take-home message here is the deep underlying structure of cosmology includes, sorry, that should be cosmologia, excuse me, that should be cosmologia, includes not just the possibility of existence of consciousness but also the possibility of the existence of its contents such as mathematics, logic and language. These possibilities are timeless and unchanging abstract aspects of existence. What actually happens can only occur within the limits they define. And considering them, one must clearly distinguish between the existence of the possibilities, ontology, and our knowledge of them, epistemology. What kinds of causality are possible in the universe and how do they relate? What's the nature of possible causal factors, abstract as well as physical, when we take emergence into account? And my position is that there are abstract as well as physical causal factors. Thoughts and emotions lead to actions. Theories lead to physical entities such as computers. Social agreements lead to things such as money, laws and rules of a game. And this is what I will be dealing with in the talk about emergence. These thoughts, emotions, theories, social agreements have causal effects and they must be recognized as existing else we would have causeless effects. Let me just give one example. The computer here was designed by human beings because they had a thought in their mind. The thought in their mind led to the existence of that thing. And so thoughts have consequences in the real world. Ontology and causation are closely related. What exists? What's the nature of existence of different types of entities? My criterion for when a thing exists is an entity must be said to exist if it demonstrably affects physical outcomes. So these various possibility spaces such as mathematics and thoughts do have outcomes and therefore they must be said to exist. That's my justification for saying that they exist. And mathematics is the clearest one. Mathematics underlies huge amount of science and engineering. The science and engineering and their products in the physical world wouldn't exist if the mathematics was didn't exist. And so I claim that it does exist because it has these outcomes. Uh, the existence of physical entities such as thoughts and computer programs also has outcomes which I will talk about later on. Now, within the universe, there are four types of causation which I claim demonstrably occur. Purposeless algorithms or causes grinding away. This is the logic of necessity. Random events meaningless making things happen. That's the category of chance. Selection processes creating order where there was none. That's adaptation and adaptive selection and purposeful actions related to goals, meaning, ethics, aesthetics. That's the category of intention. These all occur in the real universe and that's a factual statement supported by masses of data. Just for example, 
We are in this room together to discuss issues because we believe it's a meaningful thing to do. And so that's a purposeful action. Causal effects in the universe can be impersonal, deterministic, random, adaptive or purposeful. All are allowed by the possibility spaces for causal effects in the real universe because they all occur in the real universe. And these are effects in the universe. Cosmology deals with the possible spaces for physical existence and can extend to include why they are such as to allow complex life to exist. Cosmologia, I, I'm going back now to I said one must use appropriate methods of argumentation. I'm returning to that now. Cosmologia, in my opinion, must also deal with why they are the possibility spaces as well as the physical ones for thoughts, emotions, meaning and values. It's a very, very deep issue. In the universe, it, it is possible to think thoughts about meaning, about values, about right and wrong, about good and bad, uh, and all of that. So these things, thoughts, emotions, meaning and values, certainly do exist in the universe. The possibility space exists. And the deep structure of cosmologia, over and above that in cosmology, is why does the possibility spaces for those things exist? That's where the deep structure comes in. So one of the most profound issues for cosmology is why these possibility spaces exist. The deep question is why these all exist. If you, and if you want to study cosmology, this is key data to take into account. Where does it come from that these kinds of entities have any possibility of existence? What kind of pre-existence allows their actual existence? For thoughts and reasoning, for mathematical entities, why is there any logical basis for things at all? For values, the idea of good and bad, one should note here the possibility of existence of ethics, metaphysics and meaning is written into these pre-existing possibility spaces. At the very start of the universe, it was possible to think those thoughts, that possibility was only realized a huge amount later in the universe, but the possibility was there at the start. In that sense, just like mathematics, the possibility of meaning and beauty is an essential part of the pre-existing eternal Platonic reality because we can think about them. We can think about them because it's possible to think about them and that's what was written into the structure of cosmologia. The possibility has been there since long before life existed. The thoughts may have only been realized in recent times but the possibility has been there since the start of the universe. And I emphasize here there is meaning in the universe. We would not be here if we do not think the study of science and philosophy was meaningful. If you exclude this fact, you will of course deduce that the universe is meaningless. And some of my colleagues are loudly proclaiming this. Science shows there's no meaning in the universe. Is it reasonable to do so? This is what I call the fallacy of excluded evidence. The basic assumption in some books claiming to determine the meaning of life existence and everything is that the only relevant data they take into account is that from laboratories, microscopes, telescopes and particle colliders. These are the only route to truth according to this view of how we should understand the nature of the universe. Nothing to do with meaning, narratives of good and evil, love and pain, poetry, philosophy or beauty is relevant according to that viewpoint. We ignore all these aspects of existence and then surprise, we deduce that the universe is meaningless. Of course you deduce that, you've excluded any data to do with those aspects before you ever began. What kind of evidence is re re relevant for cosmologia? Data from the whole of life, not just physics or astronomy, because we're part of the universe and we live in it. There is indeed purpose in the universe, I've already said that. Either purpose emerges out of nothing or is there from the start of the foundation. Whichever that is true, the view is that they are there in the beginning in the following sense, the relevant possibility spaces were there at the beginning and those spaces are timeless and eternal. And so, the kinds of things you're seeing in those photographs and the kinds of things you see in this, this wonderful expression here. I like to walk alone on country paths, rice plants and wild grasses on both sides, putting each foot down on the earth in mindfulness, knowing that I walk on the wondrous earth. In such moments, existence is a miraculous and mysterious reality. People usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle, but I think the real miracle is not to walk on water or in thin air, but on earth. 
Every day we're engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. The blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, the black curious eyes of a child, our own two eyes, all is miracle. It's not a scientific statement, it's a statement about facts, uh, about values and the way of seeing things. This one from Flight to Eros by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I say to myself as I watch the niece, who's very beautiful, in her this bread is transmuted into melancholy grace, into modesty, into a gentleness without worlds. Sensing my gaze, she raised her eyes towards mine and seemed to smile, a mere breath on the delicate face of the waters but an affecting vision. I sense the mysterious presence of the soul that is unique to this place. It fills me with peace and my mind with the words, this is the peace of silent realms. I've seen the shining light that is born of the wheat. I'm just trying to convey to you stuff which I think is relevant for cosmology. As I say, you needn't engage with this if you don't want to, but if you want to engage with cosmology, this is the kind of evidence which I believe should be taken into account. The thing is, can anything really new come into existence? My, uh, my primary school motto was ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing, nothing can be made. <laughs> and there is at least a potential for meaning and morality built into the logical structure of the universe. The question then is if anything can come out of existence without at least some kind of precursor pre-existing. Or if rather existence to imply pre-existence some form that we rediscover or recreate rather than creating ex nihilo. The position I take is that these aspects of life are foreshadowed by these possibility spaces that allow their existence. To that extent the possibility of meaning is built into the very structure of the universe. If you take cosmology into account, not just cosmology. So the take home message, the deep structure of cosmology is the existence of the possibility spaces, not just for physical existence, but also for mental existence. All that comes into existence is foreshadowed and allowed by these possibility spaces for physical existence, for biological existence, for thoughts, emotions, meaning and values. The deep question is why all of these possibility spaces exist because they're written into the nature of reality. If you're doing purely cosmology, there's no need to take these into account. And I emphasize there's nothing wrong with doing cosmology and saying, I'm not interested in any of this stuff you've been talking about. So there's no need. But if you're doing cosmologia, then I claim you cannot and should not ignore them. And the final section is metaphysics for the universe itself. Can we use the previous to make a framework for looking at the metaphysics of the universe itself rather than for objects in the universe? Why does the universe exist? Why is it fine-tuned for life? And all we can do is generalize from what we know inside the universe to the universe itself because we've got nothing else we can use. And we have to do so on the basis either from cosmology or from cosmology. It's a philosophical choice you make which kind of data you will include. Will you only include the data from cosmology or from cosmology? Now the metaphysical options for the universe itself, generalizing from our experience, we seem to have four options. Pure chance. It's just the way it is. And that's not saying it's probable, it's saying it's what Paul Davies called happenstance. This is just the way it is, it's neither probable nor improbable, that's just the way it worked out, there's nothing more to say. The second, very probable. The universe is very probable and we base this on a multiverse, high probability in an ensemble. Necessity, this is the only way it could be, there's no other option. It's an inevitable outcome of the laws of physics and purpose is in some sense meant to be that way which is the theistic kind of option. And so these seem to be the, the logical options, pure chance, very probable necessity, or in some sense there's a purpose there underlying what is going on. The deep questions, if it's pure chance, why does the very category of happenstance exist? Where did that category come from, if it's very probable? Why does the category of high probability exist, if it's necessity? Why does the category of necessity exist? And if it's purpose, why does the category of purpose exist? Each of these options exists as a consequence of the existence of corresponding possibility spaces. And these are the deep questions, in my opinion. How do they pan out? Pure chance happenstance. In a sense, this is the quantum physics option, because as I explained in the last talk, quantum physics says things just happen. There are probabilities for the statistics, but specific things cannot be predicted. But 
happenstance has no explanatory power, you get no unification, it just happened that way and most people don't like that one, I only know one person who takes this viewpoint. <laughs> very probable, the power of statistics, the multiverse option, a very popular one, but the question is not solved because it recurs. So let's say the multiverse exists, then the question arises, why does the multiverse exist? Why is the multiverse biofriendly? Because is the multiverse biofriendly because of chance, probability or necessity? Necessity, all you do when you postulate a multiverse is shift the metaphysical questions one step up. You do not solve the metaphysical questions. Necessity, physical laws, it had to be that way. Physics has failed to find only one possible structure for the laws of physics. Instead, we've got the string theory landscape, 10 to the 500 possible laws of physics. Physics has failed in the enterprise of proving necessity. And if there was only one possible physics that could exist, you would then have to ask why would it be biofriendly? It just would defer the problem. Purpose, it was meant to be that way, is in some the theistic option, but then why does the creator exist and have the property he, she has? In the end you just have to choose between one of them as a grounded philosophical choice. You make the choice on the basis of your values, your beliefs and so on, but you can't prove any of them scientifically or philosophically as was known to Hume many times or it cannot be proven either way. My take home message, the real fundamental physical options for the universe or multiverse, if there is one, are either pure chance or purpose or intention because the other ones, the probability one and the, um, the necessity one, just ship the problem back. They don't solve the problem if it's probable on the basis of what laws is it probable. If it's... Um, if it has to happen on the basis of what laws, then you have to just re-ask those questions. In the end, your only two real options are pure chance or purpose or intention. And, and metaphysical uncertainty remains. We cannot prove or disprove either of them by science or philosophy. We have to make a choice without sufficient evidence. But we can make philosophical arguments we find persuasive either on the basis of data from cosmology or from cos cosmologia. Which data one will use is a choice one has to make, and I've made my position on this perfectly clear. And I can finish with a rather lovely update of Plato's cave to the present day. <laughs>